Hey everybody, this is one of your favorite fact finders, Adam, and co-host of Fiction or Nonfiction. This is a re-upload of the first three episodes we ever did of the program, and I do have to admit, these first three episodes we were definitely getting our feet wet. I don't think we quite found the rhythm or the notion of what we were doing with the show, so these first three episodes are a little bit loosey-goosey, if you will, so we decided to do a type of supercut to incorporate our first three episodes very food-centric. In fact, I think all three episodes contain food in some form or another. Still, though, I want to re-upload these because even though they don't quite have the spirit of later episodes, they do deal with uh, unpacking myths and legends, especially around the origins of hot dogs and the origins of Hawaiian pizza, which is, yum, very fascinating. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this, and definitely by the time we get to episode four and our next upload, we find our footing, and we definitely get to the rhythm of what the show is going to be like from here on in. Do keep in mind, this is our first season, and we're going to be having our new season coming up later this year. I hope you enjoy. Hey, so this is the Windsor Public Library. I'm Adam. I'm Dave. And we're here to find out if this story is fiction or nonfiction. Cue music. Hey, so I'm Adam here with Dave, and uh, we're doing the first episode of a brand new featurette, a brand new podcast here at Windsor Public Library. Dave, why don't you talk a little bit about what this is going to involve? I believe we're kind of discussing how to make the best chicken soup, or, or maybe like which can opener is best to open the can to make your chicken soup. That is blatantly false. So let me actually explain to you what this does involve. We are actually going to be sometimes sharing stories with each other, okay. sometimes with other staff members. And what we're going to be doing from that is determining whether you can tell if the story is true or false, or in other words, fiction. Or nonfiction. Which is why we titled it that title. So. Ah. Uh. I know. So for this first episode, we want to have a very special guest, someone who means a lot to us, who we work with every single day of the week. Our guest, Becky! Hi! So Becky is a librarian here at Windsor Public Library, and she's also part of the digital team. Uh, you might recognize her from some of her fantastic videos with another co-worker of ours, uh, What's his name again? Horace? It's actually you. No, no. It's Howie, right? Oh, oh, yes. Where is Howie right now, Becky? Howie's at home. Okay, that's good. You know, it's good to stay home right now, be safe, don't go into crowds. It's a good thing. Dave, I'm very excited for this, our first story that we're going to share. Mm-hmm. So, Becky, do you basically understand the rules of this? Yes, I think I do. Okay, just to reiterate for any of our first-time listeners, which will be everyone, since this is our first episode, yes. this is going to involve us telling you a story slash fact, and you determining whether what we shared with you is either fiction or nonfiction. Okay. So, and you know, actually, I have to admit, I did the uh, research for this one. Dave actually doesn't know what I'm going to say. I did nothing. That's right. <laughs> So extra, extra work for you next episode, Dave. Ah, uh, okay. All right, so Becky, are you ready? Don't worry. Okay, so this is a very short one, but one I think is near and dear to our hearts because it involves pizza. Good. Uh, we all know Windsor is the pizza capital of southwestern Ontario. Some might say the world. I, I would say the world. Okay. Uh, I do love me some pizza, and something I really love is pineapple on my pizza, which of course is featured prominently on the Hawaiian pizza, a mainstay here of cuisine in Windsor for many, many a moon. Uh, what I am posing to you is that the Hawaiian pizza, in spite of its name, was actually made here in Windsor, Ontario. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Well, I feel like I do remember reading that somewhere. I, I think so, too. I, I do think it's from Windsor, but I don't know. But why do they call it Hawaiian pizza? Uh, well, okay, what do you think, Becky? Yeah, uh, I'm going to go with that is true. That's a fact. True. Um, no lifelines. It's just true. True. Final answer. <laughs> Final answer. You're not the weakest link. Well, I guess you're both weak links because you're both wrong. What? 
How dare Where you? did I read that? How dare you? But but I think by proximity, it's understandable why you would think it's Windsor oh. because oh, the first no. where, where tell us back. Okay, was it Chatham? It was Chatham. Okay. Oh, you're okay. sneaky. Does anyone want to know the actual origin of the Hawaiian pizza? I I really don't want to know anymore. No. Okay, well, Dave, you can leave the Dave room. Dave is just bitter. No, no, no. Actually, please do tell us. <laughs> I want to know. Our great Hawaiian pizza was created somewhat regionally in Chatham, Ontario, and that was by San Panopoulos. Now, he was actually a Greek-born Canadian. This Greek-born Canadian had a restaurant in Chatham, Ontario, and in 1962, he was inspired in part by his experience preparing Chinese dishes, which commonly mixed sweet and savory flavors. So he experimented with adding pineapple, ham, bacon, and some other toppings to a pizza. So I do have to admit, initially, these combinations were not popular. But the addition of pineapple to the traditional mix of tomato sauce and cheese, and sometimes ham or bacon, became very popular locally after a bit of time. So, in regards to the naming of the dish, does either one of you want to take a guess why it was named the Hawaiian pizza? Want me to guess it, Dave? I'm out of guesses. Is it because of the ham? The ham and pineapple combo, is is that like a Hawaiian thing? Is it spam popular in Hawaii? I don't, I this don't know. Another, this could be another... Is that our question to answer? That's a question, though. That's not a story. I, I, I... Spam is very salty, but can you put spam on a pizza? Maybe. Uh, I personally, I wouldn't, but it's probably for reasons you're not expecting. Panopolis chose the Hawaiian pizza name after the brand of canned pineapples that he used. Oh, oh. okay, wow. Apparently in Germany, there is a variation which includes ham, pineapple, and cheese, which creates Toast Hawaii, originally introduced to Germany in 19. 19- 55. Oh. Ooh. So, I guess you could say, even though technically the Hawaiian pizza was first created somewhat in some form in Germany back in the 50s, it really was officially named and released and became the Hawaiian pizza we all know and some of us love in 1962 in Chatham, Ontario, by this wonderful Greek born Canadian who put a Polynesian fruit on top of an Italian dish. Can't get more multicultural than that, can you? Wow. What I'd like to know is, and and I don't actually know the answer to this, so we're going to have to look it up. When was the TV channel YTV first broadcast? When it was first broadcast. When did they first broadcast? So are you saying when they first broadcast it or when that channel was first labeled as YTV? Because this is the thing. For anyone who is seeking information at the library, we need to know specifically what information you're looking for. So... If you are looking for information, like when did YTV first become a television station? When did they first broadcast? Where can you go to find that information? Uh, well, usually the internet. Oh, what's that? It's a thing. Oh. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through some research and demonstrate how you will find accurate information about this. So first up always, we want to clarify what are you actually looking for? YTV was a station in the 1990s, broadcast out of Toronto. It was a variety programming of uh, children's sitcoms, television shows, whatever have you. Very youth-centric programming. Yeah, and they also had those great 3D graphics. Wonderful 3D graphics. So ahead of their time. It was like The Matrix, only oh. in, in, less expensive. Yeah, less Keanu Reeves and uh, trench coats. Even though he's Canadian, which is weird. We figured he'd be on YTV. Oh, maybe he was on YTV. Well, I guess we'll have to do that research. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the steps. Now, we want to establish, I think, for the sake of clarity, when the first YTV broadcast was. So not necessarily the channel that YTV used, but we actually want to figure out when was the first broadcast using the YTV name, the branding of it. So we're doing some research, and uh, we have our librarian, Becky, over here, Becky, were you able to find anything? So I did find an article from the CBC. It does talk about how it began, and it does say the Canadian television channel was launched in 1987. 
but hit its cultural heyday in the 1990s. Uh, so there we go. So we know the year 1987. Now, this is very crucial. We pulled up an article from what news resource again? CBC. Okay, so why are we trusting this and not uh, a random post that I made to my Facebook page today saying that YTV premiered in 1974? Because CBC is a trusted news source. It's a national news source. I would trust news from CBC because they would do the research and they would have journalists doing that research. It's not a Wikipedia article where anyone can add and edit. But what if you're getting information from Wikipedia? Is there a way to see if that information is correct? Uh, that's a very good point to bring up. So for any article people will make on Wikipedia, they have to include a list of resources or links. So in my little blurb about our Hawaiian pizza, I actually got the majority of the information initially from Wikipedia. But how did I verify that information was true? I consulted the sources. So I actually checked the original websites and articles that that Wikipedia article was based off of to verify the information. So that's something important to note. You always want to verify your information coming from what we like to call reputable sources. And usually if you're using Wikipedia, it's right at the very bottom of the article. That's true, but we do encourage you, even though they list links and resources, still double check because even though they are listing a link or listing a resource or an article, there's still a chance they might put misinformation in the actual body of the article, so we do want to encourage everyone to double check. Becky, any other interesting factoids? Since we're talking about Wikipedia, I did decide to go to the Wikipedia article, and at the beginning of the article, it says YTV is a Canadian English language specialty channel that launched on September 1st, 1988. Oh. So that's interesting. Do they actually give a link or a list to the source of that information? They do not. And then CBC says 87. So here's the thing. If you are given a contrast between two different sources of information, you have one on Wikipedia with no actual source for where it gathered that information and another one from the news agency, a reputable source, the CBC. Always go with the information from the reputable source. That would be CBC in this case. Also, another factoid is... The very first broadcast was hosted by Canadian comedic icon John Candy. It also featured a performance from Canadian band Blue Rodeo. And what do you do if there is no sources? Well then, unfortunately, I guess it remains an unsolved mystery. That's a different show. Oh, well, I, I, what do we do, Becky? Do we do more research? I mean, if it weren't myself doing the research as a librarian, I might email my local librarian and see if they have any information for me. That's right. And we do want to remind you, in addition to our website where you can browse for books, movies, video games, and so much more from our collection, we actually have a number of links to databases which collect articles and information on a number of different topics and subjects. So definitely check that out at windsorpubliclibrary.com, a great one-stop place for your research needs. Well, that was our first ever episode of fiction. Or nonfiction? So, Becky, thank you so much for playing. Uh, we have no prizes. The only prize we have is knowledge. And uh, we want to let you know that you can get some knowledge by visiting windsorpubliclibrary.com, where you can get more facts and interesting information, not only on pizza, but other great things in the world. This was fiction. Or lunchtime. Or that. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. So this is the Windsor Public Library. I'm Adam. I'm Dave. And we're here to find out if this story is fiction. Or facts. Sorry, nonfiction. Cue music. Fiction or nonfiction. We are joined by our recurring guest, who I guess should just be like a regular contributor at this point, Becky. Hello. Well, we have a hot dog related story for you to test your hot dog trivia knowledge. Good, I've been waiting for this moment. One could even say, hot dog! Don't. No. Okay. So, we actually have a few things to share with you, and we want to see how much of a hot dog connoisseur you actually are. Okay, I'm ready. So, here, I'm ready. here, is, the, here is the first data bite we're going to share with you. Beep boop. 
Go ahead, Dave. Give that to Becky. There's a difference between Frankfurters and Wieners. Hmm. I like. I want to say, oh, man, that's hard. I. I want to say that there is a difference. Does it have something to do with the the like geographic location? Yes. <gasps> Gold star again <laughs> for you. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. So as you may determine by the sounds of the names, they are from different regions. If you ever head to an authentic German sausage shop, which you ought to do at one point in your life, uh, you're going to find out that there are two different types of sausages that they sell. Wieners and... Frankfurters. Frankfurters, of course. Well, Frankfurters are made entirely with pork, so that's one difference. And as the name implies, they were originally created in Frankfurt, Germany. However, wieners are made of something a little bit different. Oh, it's, it's a mixture of pork and beef. And just as a little bonus question for you, Becky, do you have any idea where the wiener may have originated? You know, my, my German geography is not very good. Okay, Can well, I guess? Well, Dave, you see the answer. I, don't, I didn't look at it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, in that case, sure. Were they created in Wienerville? Oh, no. I believe that's in the U.S. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> Vienna. Wiener, oh. Vienna. Oh. Okay. So this is, this is really confusing, too, especially in North America, because Franks, as they're called, tend to be made from all beef. Huh. So there we are. In case you're curious how we got these facts, you can look them up in the great American hot dog book, which is a legitimate thing. Or you can go to the dailymeal.com where you can look at their article from 2016, 12 Things You Didn't Know About Hot Dogs. We have one more question for you, Becky. Oh, good. This is an open-ended question. What is the origin of the term hot dog? Oh. Oh, like, how did they come up with the name? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Like, I feel like it originated in the United States. I will say that the first recorded use of the term hot dog was from the U.S. Okay. And sorry, the question again was... What is the origin of the term hot dog? Can she phone a friend? There's no lifelines. Oh. So I'm, so I'm trying to guess, like the place and also why well you you know what you got the country so we don't okay. need to worry about that just basically how the term hot dog came into being um i mean i would assume because it's cooked i don't know why anyone would associate a long tube with the dog unless we're talking about wiener dogs there you go someone saw a wiener dog and i want to eat dog. that yeah i don't know i don't know <laughs> Put a bun on it, I'm done. <laughs> the suspense is killing us. Tell us, Adam. Well, you're not going to like this. Oh, no. No, no. No, no. one actually knows. Okay, okay. You thought it was I thought it, it was actually, actually did have to, Yeah, and I was like, please don't. No, just don't Are tell we gonna me. really tell people what's inside hot dogs? No, let's not do no, that. Again, um, I'm sure that's, <laughs> that was never actually known. Okay, so the term hot dog has actually been debated for over a century all that's really recorded is that the earliest use of the term hot dog appeared in December 31st, 1892 in an edition of the Patterson Daily News from New Jersey. The story was about a local traveling vendor known as Hot Dog Morris. And uh, that information is taken from the absolutely historical hot dog website, hotdogchicagostyle.com. So it's named after a person, maybe. Potentially. Now, that's the whole thing. And I have gone through other resources. No one actually knows the exact origin of the term hot dog. And I guess forever that will remain unknown. You thought I was going to say unsolved mystery this time, but I didn't. No, like Google doesn't know either. I think this is a little bit interesting for our show because we've always talked about, and by always, I mean in two other episodes, but we've discussed what the best process is in order to find information this is the first time where there is no information to find. If you want to do your own research, listeners, and you want to be able to uncover the great mystery of our time, why the hot dog is called what it is, you might want to start some research now by going to Windsor Public Library 
Becky, what website do they need to go to? WindsorPublicLibrary.com. That's very correct. Very correct. So that that's it. That's all I have for hot dogs. Uh, I, I will say there is one other story. This is, I'm just going to tell you, this is recorded. And I just love this story. Apparently there was a, a Bavarian immigrant named Anton Fustenwanger. I'm sure I mispronounced that. He sold sausages on the streets of St. Louis, and he provided his customers with gloves to prevent them from burning their fingers. But when his gloves kept getting stolen, his wife suggested just to use a bread roll instead. Wow. Hot dog. Well, with that said, Becky, thanks for joining us. As always, there are no prizes to win except for knowledge, but you can get your knowledge by going to our website, windsorpubliclibrary.com. Hey, is it time for a random Dave question slash fact? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, my question is about styrofoam. Everyone knows what styrofoam is. You find it in boxes of things. Uh, you know, it's all over. Um, but my question is, is styrofoam toxic to humans? Well, if you eat it, I imagine. But like in general? Like just for touching it? Oh, hmm, I'm going to say no. Okay, so here's my answer. Styrofoam is bad for the environment, as you might know. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more cities are, are starting to use less styrofoam options. That's why sometimes when you order takeout, it'll be in like a cardboard type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but because polystyrene foam, which is what it is, it's it's kind of hazardous uh, to the environment and our health. Obviously, if you eat, don't eat it, please. Please never. Um, but it's it's littered with a lot of waste, and despite being only one percent of that being waste, it makes up to ten to forty percent of litter found in streams. Um, and and there's a whole bunch uh, I could go on. And here's the thing: it doesn't really break down. Like you do have microscopic elements of it that do break off but otherwise it doesn't biodegrade it just kind of stays there yeah and if you're wondering where I, I was getting some of this information from um, I got it from the cehn.org website which is the Children's Environmental Health Network so it's a, it's a national multidisciplinary organization um, which their whole goal is to protect uh, children and developing children from environmental health hazards and to pro promote Healthier environments. Um, so it's like an organization that, that uh, that's pretty cool. That does that. Um, I got so a little factoid for you too. Okay, yeah, bring it. Okay, so since we're on the topic of packaging, so obviously styrofoam not good for the environment, not really great for people in general. So as you mentioned, there's a lot of initiatives made recently to change and swap out styrofoam with other types of portable containers. Did you realize that there are scientists who are actually developing mycelium containers? No, what is that? Mushrooms. So mushrooms are actually being grown and processed in a way where they are making sturdy containers for takeout food and for shipping food products to stores. Well, these are perfectly biodegradable and cause zero environmental harm. Wow, cool. Um, and this is going on a trend. There's also edible packaging, which is a, a burgeoning thing I don't know how far it's gotten, especially with the pandemic kind of holding back a lot of production, but that's something else to consider. You can have a, a nice mushroom burger and then eat your mushroom container right after. We don't recommend read, eating styrofoam, though. It's no, no, never eat styrofoam. Not, not a good idea. For now, we're going to say so long. Have a great day. This has been Fiction or Nonfiction. Hey, I'm Adam. I'm Dave. And this is Fiction or Nonfiction. Q music. Fiction or nonfiction. Hey, so as mentioned, I'm Adam and this is Dave, and this is the show where we go through stories and we determine if they are fiction or nonfiction. So uh, last week we had our very first debut episode, as opposed to the very last debut episode, uh, where we went through some interesting facts about pizza, YTV, and Wikipedia, and on this episode, both me and Dave have some information to share with each other, and we're going to have to determine if the stories we're sharing are indeed true or false. And Dave, I told you you had to do a lot of work for this episode. 
I did have homework, and I think I did it properly. I think you may have done it five minutes right before we started recording. I cannot confirm or deny that. <laughs> well, with that said, uh, I want to hear from you first. So what we're going to first start off the show with is a story from Dave. Dave, what do you have to share? A story slash fact slash yes. info bite. So my question relates to radio stations. The very first radio station to, to be commercial and broadcast in Canada. My question is, for you, Adam, was this in Toronto? True or false? Ooh, was the first Canadian radio station or broadcast from Toronto? Station. Ah, see, that's tricky. Hmm. Commercial radio. Commercial radio. Now, this is interesting because it's just not like a, uh, say, any radio broadcast, say, from a private, uh, you know, ham radio. This is... No. The first commercial radio station in Canada. Was it in Toronto? True or false? Mm. Yes or no? Okay. Also, I just want to comment. I said ham radio, and we were obsessed with ham on the last episode. It seems to be a recurring theme for this program. Spam radio. Spam radio. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to say not true. You are correct. Yes! You, what did I win? You were awarded no prizes. Oh, oh, joy, just like the rest of my life. Except for <laughs> a wealth of information that I'm about to tell everyone about. Oh, okay, now, Dave, I, I'm curious. Where did you get this information from, just to start with? Okay, as we discussed last time, it's important to get your information from reputable sources. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, like a news source like CBC or like maybe even a government website that has uh, information and facts. I got this information from a history and culture section from the Government of Canada website. Oh, okay, very reputable. Of course, they have researchers that have been hired by the government to actually put this information online for Canadians to read. So what does it say? So it's under the early commercial radio broadcasting in Canada, which took place from 1918 to 1932. Commercial radio began in Canada with a station in Montreal. Ah, and that station was known as XWA. From its first broadcast until the creation of a public system, because this was commercial, that happened in 1932, there was a big radio craze at the time. It was a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone was really quite crazy about it. Um, so yeah, the very first one took place in Montreal. That's amazing. Now, what year was it that it was first broadcast in Montreal? Do you have that information? Uh, 1918. 1918, that's incredible. you got to figure, over 100 years worth of radio broadcast, commercial radio broadcast in Canada. That's really uncanny. Now, I'm going to add a little bonus fact. I love which bonus. That's great. I misread this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, commercial radio in Canada got its start, I originally thought it said, from the Macaroni Wireless Telephone Company. That's not That true. would be incredible. I don't even know if Macaroni existed in 1918. It kind of looks like a telephone, like a little macaroni elbow, a tiny little elf. Hello. A little less cheesy. But uh, it, it actually got its start in Canada in 1918 from the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of Canada. Well, that's not as exciting as Macaroni, but I will accept it. Very interesting fact. Now... We want to go through some steps here, and we want to talk about how you get this information. So let's say this was a school assignment. For an example, you were told you need to issue a report saying what the first commercial radio station was in Canada. How would you answer this question? Well, usually you have to get more than one source. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the purposes of this show, I did check a few sources, but... You can usually rely on a government historical website because they have their facts, they've done their research. Um, and usually, you know, sometimes they actually have little sources listed at the bottom of their page. Um, and this, this article that I'm reading was actually last updated in October of 2021. So it's still fairly up to date. Yeah, so usually you should try to get a few sources. So I use this website, um, but you could also use actual like book resources if you're able to find some books. Usually nonfiction books will have this information. Anything about Canadian uh, broadcasting history, you know, just to continue on this theme, since we are so close to Detroit, we should also mention a well-known station in Windsor and Detroit history is the CKLW station. Mm -hmm. That broke a lot of bands that made them uh, more well-known and popular at a time when if there wasn't something like CKLW, that wouldn't have happened. 
Some of these bands include Elton John, The Who, countless others. Alice Cooper, yeah. I know he got a huge break on CKLW. So since we are close to Detroit, I, I wanted to ask, what year was the very first Detroit radio station broadcast? So, and th- this would have been, I'll give you a little hint, this okay. would have been an AM station because at, at the time there was a- FM didn't exist. They didn't have that band. For, so yeah. did this happen in 1920, 1918, or 1917? I'm going to go for a round number. I'm going to go for 1920. I have no basis for this. I'm just guessing. Okay. 1920 is the correct answer. Yes. And the station was known as WWJ 950 AM. And it was, it broadcast, it had a 50,000 watt transmitter, which is quite powerful. And it broadcast in Newport, Monroe County, and Michigan. And it was owned by a newspaper. And it became the very first 24 hour all news radio station. Ah. And if you're wondering where I got this information from, there's a wonderful website called the Detroit Historical Society. And it has all types of information about Detroit history. That's where I got this. And there's a little bit of references, like from the Detroit News. You know, I find that fascinating because we ended up hearing that the first commercial radio station in Canada debuted before the first commercial radio station in Detroit. Yeah. um, That's amazing to think of. Montreal was ahead of the game by two years. You know, really fascinating history there for radio within the city. There was actually a great documentary that came out a few years ago. Dave probably knows what I'm talking about. It's called The Big Eight. Yeah, and that's about the CKLW uh, boom and everything that happened with that station in Windsor and Detroit. Yeah, so we do encourage you to check that out. And if you're wondering how can I actually watch this movie, well, good news. You can borrow it from your local branch of the Windsor Public Library. You can actually place a hold on it by going to our website at windsorpubliclibrary.com. You can also find more information about the history of local radio and international radio through our catalog. Dave, did you find any more information about the stations yet? I'm just trying to verify if this was, in fact, the first station. It was uh, the first commercial all-news radio station. Okay, so a little bit of a difference there. Well, since we're on the topic of mediums, you know, we're talking about radio, I have a question yes. for you. Okay. Another fiction or... Nonfiction. N- exactly. You're so enthusiastic. I'm glad, Dave. Uh, so this is involving a different medium, however. The medium is the message in this case because I'm going to be talking about television. Ooh. Now you need that? To... Moving pictures? Uh, it is complete motion pictures, including sound. What? Okay. And you have to tell me if this is indeed fact or fiction, myth or truth, fiction or nonfiction. So here it is. Reading in the dark or sitting too close to the TV ruins your eyesight. I want to say false, but I think it's true. You think it's true? Yeah. It is weighing on the side of not true. Oh, so it's not true. It's fiction. Oh. Okay, well, then I was wrong. You were wrong. I'm sorry about that, Dave. That's okay. Um, so you can sit as close to the TV as you want. Well, <laughs> maybe don't do that, but... Uh, too late. Uh, so um, what I was going to say was, just to jump back what we were talking oh, about... Oh, sure, sure. The first licensed by the federal government in the U.S. was that station I mentioned, mentioned WWJ, August 20th, 1970. Okay. So not 100% it's the first ever station, but it's the first federally licensed commercial news station okay now do you want to find out the truth about this great myth that tv ruins your eyesight i do okay so the myth that tv damages your eyesight uh these myths started becoming popular around the late 1950s and 1960s and at the time it may have actually been true do you have any idea why that may have been true at that time tvs were more radioactive that's actually true. Oh, I was trying to make a joke. No, no, that, that's a horrible <laughs> truth. <laughs> TV sets emitted high amounts of radiation. In fact, so high that they were reported by many physicians to cause eye damage, particularly in children that would spend long amounts of time in front of the television. Oh, well, that's, that's something. That is something. So around the time of the 1970s, they started manufacturing TVs in a significantly different way, especially when color TV became a sensation. And so at that point, the type of radiation being emitted from television 
no longer was being emitted. It was severely reduced. So at this point, there is no scientific data showing that contemporary televisions or computer monitors cause eye damage. That's interesting. Now, you may wonder then, if your child sits pretty close to the TV or complains about having strain in their eyes from looking at a screen too long, what's going on? According to this article, which I pulled from Live Science, it's recommending that if your child does make these sort of complaints, to actually get them to an optometrist because they might be nearsighted. Sitting too close does not create a need for glasses, but that might actually help remedy the habit. Uh, this was an article that was issued in 2016. This is a great resource because it has experiments for young potential scientists to actually experiment around with a little bit. They collect articles from different scientific periodicals and collect them. They're kind of like a web equivalent in a way to popular mechanics or popular science. Uh, but all their information is verified by people within the medical and the scientific fields, and they do source where they get their information from. So again, that's why I would rely upon this rather than just an old wives tale about not sitting too close to the TV. Now, I also asked about reading in the dark. So what do you feel about reading in the dark? Is that any different? Well, you might not be able to see. I mean, that's true, right? Um, but yeah, I, I suppose it, it's probably similar. It is very similar. So certainly, as you said, reading in dim light or reading in the dark, it can cause your eyes to work so hard that they hurt. It can cause strain. However, there have been many studies practiced, and none of them have determined that reading in the dark causes long-term eye damage. There you go. We have a couple myths debunked, and we have some interesting information for you. Uh, so what do you think, Dave? After this, are you going to be sitting close to the TV again? Oh, I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best answer. Um, we do want to stress we're not advocating to sit too close to your computer monitor or TV either. Why not? Um, it, it just It's not good. It will hurt your eyes. Will it permanently damage them? Probably not, but it will create a bit of strain. Maybe over time if you're constantly doing it, perhaps. Yeah. So especially right now, we're a big conversation for parents around children is screen time, how much screen time you allow a child. I mean, I guess this is a little bit of a relief hearing this information, knowing as a parent this will not cause permanent damage to your children's eyesight. However, uh, it can still cause some strain and uh, pain by looking at a screen for so long because you are focusing on uh, a particular close object for so long. Give your child a break. Do you limit screen time? We do recommend that. So uh, do you have anything you want to share with our listeners before we head out? I think, don't we normally have like a random Dave fact? Well, well normally by our previous episode, we did have a random Dave question. So, oh, okay. Well, what's your random Dave fact for this episode? Well, my question to you is, it's random. Okay. Okay, but why does helium make your voice go higher if you inhale it? We're not advocating to inhale helium, by the way, but why does it make your voice higher if you do that? You know what's good? We happen to have someone that can answer that question for us here right now. We're going to go over to our special guest for this episode, a returning guest, our only guest so far, Dr. <laughs> Becky. I would guess that it has something to do with the chemicals. Uh, let me see specifically why. So based on, based on an article from why.org, um, asking why exactly does helium make your voice sound so weird, it says it's because helium is so much lighter than air. When sound waves speed up, but their frequency stays the same, each wave stretches out. It's a gas that is much heavier than air, so when it's inhaled, it shortens sound waves. So the lower tones in the voice are amplified and the higher ones fade out. There you go. And yes. if you check other science websites, you'll, you know, you'll see that helium is indeed lighter than air. So that, that's why, it seems. Thank you. Fun facts. A special thank you to Dr. Becky slash not a real MD. And that was fiction. Or nonfiction. 
So make sure you tune in next time for more exciting facts. And if you do want to get any great information about helium, television, or radio, or anything else that you might want. Pizza. And pizza. You can just go to WindsorPublicLibrary.com or give us a call at 519-255-6770. Until then, I'm Adam. Oh, I'm Dave. And this has been Fiction or Nonfiction.